Tour. I was a graduate in 1994, um, and uh, I have 25 minutes today to talk to you guys. I uh, it's going to be a challenge for me to get through what I want to get through in 25 minutes. So I know we have a little. I talked a lot in class. I remember, and I always got the looks, and so I still. Can, uh, I'm just having a, a flashback moment. Uh, yeah, it was a good thing they didn't have iPhones back then. Um, Remember the fire alarm. Yeah, I know. I'm like, did he do, like, do that intentionally? Or? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go. I'll stand up here so you guys can hear me okay. I don't have to shout. Uh, so I'll start and talk a little bit about, just briefly about uh, Aegon and Transamerica. But what I'm going to talk to you guys today about is what is an industry hot topic called model risk management. So whether you're in actuarial science, whether you're in statistics, whether you're a quant, econ, um, whether you're a professor, whether you're a student, whether you're employed, uh, we heard about the FDA this morning, it doesn't matter what your industry is, if you are working in models in any of those industries, um, classes, um, for, the, for the professors in the room, I hope you take this back and start educating you know, with your staff or with your students on that. Um, really understanding you know, where we are as an industry in terms of understanding the risks and everything that we're doing with our models is very important. So, and then I'm going to kind of go through a little case study about we, the, uh, the, um, what we've done at Transamerica to address this and some, some insights that have come out of it. Okay, so basically people hear Transamerica, they hear Aegon, don't quite understand it. So Aegon is our parent company. Uh, Transamerica is our U.S. branding of that company. So Aegon is one of our world's leading providers of insurance, pensions, and investments. And really, like most insurance companies, our, our purpose is to help people take responsibility for their financial futures. Um, we're located, uh, many folks know about Transamerica, and you think Cedar Rapids. Uh, actually, we have many uh, main Transamerica offices across the United States, and we have actuaries and PhDs, et cetera, employed in all those, most of those locations. So I got some numbers on the actuarial staff just because I'm closest to that. So uh, as a company in the U.S., we employ roughly 400 actuaries with about 150 of those in Cedar Rapids, and we currently have over 50 students, so individuals still taking exams, um, that are part of our actuarial development program. Uh, we also offer internship opportunities and have a very formalized program there as well. Okay, so let's let's jump into what I really want to talk about is 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 model risk management. So I'm going to read verbatim what's here because this is what's important when you say model. What does that mean? Um, so here's the regulatory guidance. It says a financial model is a quantitative method, system, or approach that applies statistical, economic, financial, or mathematical theories, techniques, and assumptions to process input data into quantitative estimates. So essentially, that's everything from soup to nuts, inputs to outputs, any part of that process. So as an insurance company, why are models important? Well, models are really a fundamental part of the insurance operations. Um, we use models for many different purposes. So whether it be for our financial statements what, what, and, and our reserving, whether you're talking about pricing new products and developing new products, uh, we have statistical models that do our economic scenario generators and you know other forecasting on some of our macroeconomic variables, uh, risk and capital models, business models. Basically, models really are, are, are at the core of a lot of the fundamental decision making uh, and profile of, of the company. And because of this and some of the failures and in, in, in industry news that has happened um, with banks and other insurance companies, we're also seeing a lot of increased focus and regulatory guidance coming out um, and executive management, our boards are all very interested in, in the company's um, model risk management capabilities. Okay, so let's define model risk a little bit. Okay, model risk should, and again, this is straight from the guidance, should identify the sources of risk and assess the magnitude. Model risk increases with greater model complexity, higher uncertainty about inputs and assumptions, how broadly that model is used, and the larger potential impact. 
So to put it in context, I'm going to give one example. You can actually go up to Wikipedia. I was looking this up, and there's a lot of examples out there. But here's an example where a model had lost J.P. Morgan in 2012. Um, they took a five to seven billion dollar loss, and the reason for that was because the basically there was a manual error in an Excel spreadsheet that resulted in a large loss. And this isn't unique. This is actually very common. Um, I was talking with Gordon earlier, and, and, and we, when Gordon works a lot with our assumptions and models, and you can make a small misestimation, and it end up being a huge financial impact on a, on a company's results. Okay, so what have we done at Transamerica to address this? So you may be here, model risk management, model validation. So to help mitigate this, we developed a very robust uh, model risk management program. And I'm going to kind of go into a few of those details so you can think about a practical application of maybe the work that, that you all do. So we launched this formal pro program last year, and the scope, without knowing all of the details, was a very high-level goal of we're going to go through and independently validate all of our high-risk models. Um, globally, uh, we uh, are, because we're Aegon and we're a European company, we also fall under Solvency II. Uh, they are a lot further ahead in the U.S. in terms of their regulatory requirements, so um, we're very fortunate for that reason being a European parent because we have a very robust framework in place. So one of the first things we did is create a model inventory. So basically all that's doing is saying, all right, let's go out there and you know, make an inventory of all the models that are used in the company. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at those models and we're going to classify them based off of how complex the model is and how material the model is. And so what do I mean by that? So complexity can be you know, maybe how sensitive is that model to market changes. Or where do we have variable options that the, the policyholder can take? Where are there special features that really makes the most changes in that model? Uh, materiality, that's how, you know, how uh, sensitive is that model or how material is it to the financial results of the company? So is it just a small piece of the pie or are we talking this is a model that produces a material part of our balance sheet? So once we went through that assessment and of course, there's a ton more details underneath that, but this is the high-level version. We classified them based off of your combination of complexity and materiality. And for Transamerica, the first time through this exercise, we came up with, and we focused on actuarial and hedging models only, uh, we came up with a model inventory of over 400 models, of which 60 of them were classified as high risk. And I want to explain that. I need to pull up my numbers here. I want to explain that a little deeper on that 60. When we're talking about 60 models, we're actually talking a lot more than just the number 60. One second here. So for 60 models, what do we mean by that? So of those 60 models, that entailed over 350 spreadsheets that had multiple tabs, complex calculations, spreadsheets creating spreadsheets, spreadsheets linked together. So behind the scenes, underneath that model, you had a lot of complexity. Tools and software, there were more than 150 applications and databases used in calculating throughout that entire model process. In terms of input files, so things coming in from different sources feeding into that model, we had more than 1,200 input files by source, scenario, purpose, and there was all multiple data fields within that. And then output files, same thing, there's more than like 225 spreadsheets, models, reports that all had varied uh, results and usage. So the next step is once we had the inventory, once we've classified them, once we got going, the focus became on documentation. Now, especially if you're a student, I'm sure you don't like writing out what you did, you just want to get it done, right? As actuaries, we want to do the calculations. We want to figure it out. We want to, you know, we want to make decisions and play and go. What we don't like to do is document our rationale behind, well, why did we make that decision? Or how did we come to that, um, that judgment that we're making? So we created these massive documents that basically talk about the model history um, some of these models are, you know, north of 20 plus years old, have gone through 
you know, many different users. So the person who built the model is not even with the company anymore. So the history talks about the purpose, the ownership history evolution. The model methodology, that really goes into your technical explanations of the model, um, including some of the specific features of that product, whether it be a fixed annuity, variable annuity, life insurance, et cetera. Um, so same thing, I'll put an example, try and always try to make it uh, real for folks. Um, so one of the sections is we talk about the product design and business considerations. Um, so this was for a variable deferred annuity and it was talking about the products and risks. The variable annuity guarantees listed above are equivalent to complex put options. The option value increases when the stock market goes down, sold to policyholders. Their main risks are equity risk, interest rate risk due to the long duration of the guaranteed payments, and policyholder behavior risk. Okay, so you've got the documentation started. Now it's really to go and do this baseline testing of your model. And what do I mean by that? Well, you're the current person who runs the model. Somebody else built it. You don't have all, you're starting to get the documentation in place, but you really want to go and say, all right, I'm going back to first principles as if I was building this whole thing myself. And I say whole thing, because remember all of the numbers I talked about of how complex this was behind it. Um, so you really can't do the whole thing because that would take an infinite amount of time to do. Um, but basically, you want to go and you do this baseline testing to confirm, you know, are you producing the right cash flow schemes? Are all of the product features appropriate? Um, identifying the simplifications and limitations. And this is a real big one. So, so what does that mean? So a simplification basically is you don't, you don't model every policy, every single detail, every single state variation. You don't do all of those things individually because you would have to have assumptions for all of that. You would have to, um, it would take massive runtime, even with today's technology. So you might do things where you're grouping things together or compressing the data. Maybe you're grouping things together by every five years, or maybe you're looking at um, are they smoke or non-smoke or I'm putting cohorts of groups together and setting assumptions on that basis. Then also as part of baseline testing, you do a lot of, and I'll kind of go to, I'm not gonna go through this slide, but I'll just keep it up there, but you also do a lot of the sample recalculations and uh, creating that statistical sample, understanding the model, its purpose, the assumptions going in, this is actually a very critical part because you wanna make sure that you get a representative sample and you are sufficiently comfortable with the output then that's coming, coming out of that model. Uh, let's see, what else have I touched on? Assumptions, actually that's another one I haven't touched on. So assumptions are also very important um, to the model. Uh, there are areas within the company that do experience studies, um, then interpreting those experience studies, you know, making it relevant to the model. They're projecting out 30, 50, et cetera years. Um, in many cases, even the data that you have is limited. Uh, so think of something like a long-term care policy where we're trying to project out, you know, to high attained ages and, and, and what the rate is people are going to go into nursing homes um, or assisted living facilities, home health care, and that data just doesn't exist today. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really understand what we know and what we don't know and then, of course, coming back to documenting your expert judgment that you're having at that time, because somebody 20 years from now, when they're saying, what the heck, right? <laughs> At least they have the rationale back in the day, because there might be some really valid information that you had there. Okay, so once the person who owns the model has gotten through this whole process, um, one of the key components of a model validation program is having someone who is completely independent from the, the group of people who are running the model and the business that's producing the financial results coming in and doing an independent validation. So at Transamerica Agon, our independent validations are done through our risk management department, what, what, what I'm part of. And what that independent validation is doing is it's really coming in and reviewing all of the the, the person who's doing that has really no incentive, no tie to the model. Um, they're really coming in in a way to try to find things and really validate that that model is performing and fit for purpose. So they come in, review the documentation, do some of their own sample recalculations, but really leverage the work that's already been done and to, to offer up a uh, model opinion. 
So I have an example. This was, this was um, so again, we did 60 models last year. This is one of the model opinions that came out um, overall. And there's, there's actually a process and a calculation behind how these numbers all work out. But as we go through and do that independent validation, we look at things in different topics. So we have six different topics we're saying, um, you know, when you find a gap in the model, is it more tied to the methodology? Uh, was it more about the model development and testing was lacking somewhere? Is it a data problem? Assumptions? Um, is it about the preparing for and validating the model runs? So checking your inputs? Uh, or is it basically reporting and, and use of results? And so the gaps can be then classified. Again, we have a framework where you classify them as low, medium, or high. Uh, and um, low gaps are something that, you know, could be something as simple as a documentation uh, versus a high gap could be something where you're really outside the bounds of industry best practice. And so in this example, we had a total of 64 gaps. A couple of our categories um, ended up in the yellow category, which is um, then overall model opinion ended up as yellow. Our overall scoring then for these models is, okay, is it a positive model opinion, or which means is it in the green or yellow category, which is kind of down at the bottom, or is it, you know, does the score make it come out as amber or red? Um, amber's a Dutch thing, we use amber everywhere <laughs> in our company. But does it come out as amber or red? And um, really, if it's a model that's in those categories, then you know that's a that's a sign to management that more work needs to be done on that, and then remediation efforts begin. And there's usually a certain timeline that they have to get that model more fit for purpose. Okay, so what did we learn through through all of this exercise? So when we looked at overall all of the findings that came out of our model, um, we found that we really had a lot of confidence in the accuracy of our model results. Um, we had limited findings from. Um, uh, ineffective actuarial development, meaning we are usually in line with all of the regulations uh, when uh, product features were coded appropriately in most cases. Uh, so we had a lot of confidence in our results. The things that were lacking and where we really need to have more improvement is really that control environment around our models and taking models through a formal change management process. And again, that goes back to you don't just test and change things in production on the fly and go forward. Really stepping back and saying, okay, person A developed the model. Person B is going to come in and check it and make sure everything's okay. You're going to do that all in a separate environment, system environment. And then once that's all approved, then you can move it, move it up to production and use it in, in, um, in the real world. Um, the big culture shift we have is we really need to, and we call that like an IT discipline. There's a software development life cycle when people are pushing code, uh, and, and we really need in the, the actuarial and statistical worlds to slow down a bit and start really following that discipline more. The other thing was the processes, as some of the numbers I said earlier, had heavy manual intervention. Um, so we had all of these data sources. This, this is normal. So if this is what you're seeing. You probably can comment on that. I mean, uh, this, is, you know, this is now where the consultants are making all the money in the industry because people have seriously like, you know, everyone's trying to automate and, and make things more efficient and less manual interaction. And that's because we have errors popping up. And, and many companies have errors popping up. And again, I'll use a hedging example. You're off a little bit and you know, boom, you just, you just put on the wrong hedge on the wrong amount. Um, but again, this is really gonna require that IT world and the actuarial worlds working closely together. Which leads to the last thing and, and, and is back to the comments that have been said earlier, big data, actuarial transformation really getting to, there's tools out there, there's systems where things can kind of be pretty seamless input all the way to output, um, but using the data we have, capturing all of that data. Uh, so Transamerica has a separate department now that's created that's really working on actuarial transformation um, and, and, and you know, allowing the actuaries, the statisticians, the quant guys, you know, to do more analytical work and spending less time manually hand-holding and, and, and doing the, the robust calculations. And that's all I had today.